Good morning. Welcome to fellowship. Let's stand together. Let's lift our voices this morning and sing of God's unfailing love for us. When darkness tries to roll over my bones, when sorrow comes to steal the joy I am, when brokenness and pain is all I No, I won't be shaking, no. Cause my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. She
good to worship the King with you this morning. We are so glad that you're here at Fellowship Brentwood. From Ephesians 2, it says, For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments and ordinances, that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. We are reconciled this morning by the precious blood of the cross, and therefore we are free to come boldly because we've been freed from the chains that held us captive. Amen, church? That's good news to celebrate. Let's continue to worship and lift our voice and thank the Lord for the forgiveness that is ours because of the precious blood Jesus shed for us on the cross. Thank you, Jesus. We praise your name. We worship you, Lord. Sing, once we were lost and so far away. Once we were lost and so far away. Wandering in darkness, covered in shame without you. Without you. And now we are found by a love that is stronger. No longer blind, we can see all along it was you. It was you. So worthy, worthy is the Lamb seated in heaven. Beautiful the blood. We are forgiven forever. Forgiven forever. The victory is won. Jesus is risen. Forgiven forever, forgiven forever. Before we had fallen, redemption was planned. You were our hope long before time began. It was you. Yes. It was.
We do love you. We're so grateful for your love. You loved us first, Jesus. You loved us in our sin, in our brokenness. And you came and you showed us what true love looks like. You laid down your life for us, all the way to the cross, reconciling us to yourself making peace with us through your precious, perfect blood. Jesus, thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Receive our adoration, our affection, our worship. You alone are worthy of it, Jesus. Would you make our hearts fertile soil this morning as your word is proclaimed? Would you change us and mold us? Make us more like yourself. Lord, would you receive all the honor and glory that you are due. We bless your name, and we pray all this in the matchless and mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Because we are reconciled to God, 
through his precious blood, we are also reconciled to one another. So let's take a minute now to say hello to someone near you and let's wish them a happy official fall. welcoming you to fellowship this morning. If you're a guest, uh, we're, we're delighted you're here. My name's Lloyd Shadrach. I'm one of the teaching pastors along with Rob Sweet. Rob Sweet is our lead pastor, and Rob and I team teach here at uh, Franklin Congre at, at Brentwood Congregation, and he's teaching at the Franklin Congregation uh, this week. Next week, I'll be at the Franklin Congregation, and Rob will be here. It's, it's rooted in our core values, which tell us the scriptures uh, remind us that together... Uh, is better. We are made to cooperate and work in such a way as we would work in teams. So I want you to know that. Also, if you're a guest, uh, you got when you walked in, let me grab one down here, a program. And on the bottom of that program is a little card that I want to invite you to tear off and fill out, drop in the offering, or better yet, stop and give it to someone in the uh, atrium out here, the connect point where they, you can give it to them. You can ask them a question about fellowship, uh, what it would mean to get connected here. It doesn't have to be Fellowship Bible Church by any means. There are some great churches in our community, but it must be a community of faith that you plug yourself into for spiritual growth. So that's our encouragement to you, and we'd love to help you however we can. For the body, uh, this is a, a way we get your prayer requests. So don't be shy. How can we pray for you? The elders, as they meet every other week, are praying for these requests, and uh, we want you to. We'll also have people up front at the end of the service to pray with you. We're doing that every week, and so I hope you would uh, take advantage of that. There's also an intro class to anyone who wants to get to know fellowship the first Sunday of every month. So you'll hear us repeat that over and over again. Uh, finally, we have a baptism service coming up November 10th. So if you're interested in being baptized, go online, fill out a form, we'll interview you, we'll have a process we walk through with you because baptism is that really in, in the scriptures, that first step of obedience, having come to faith in Jesus. And so we want to make sure that you, you, you've put your faith in Christ, you know why you're being baptized, what it means. It is a physical, tangible expression of the inward reality that God has saved you because you've put your trust in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. I hope you will sign up there. We'll do those baptisms up here in the tub. And may I say, because I think this, you know, I wouldn't say this everywhere, but unique to our culture and our time, it is really common for many of us to come to faith in Christ in our 20s, 30s, it may be when you're a teenager, and then life just goes by, and you find yourself sitting here today, I'm 59, you're 59, and you go, I've never been baptized, but I would be so embarrassed to do it now. Move through that. If that's the step of obedience that God has for you, it's never too late. It's not that you're not saved, you know, not that at all. But that may be just the, the moment of obedience for you to say, you know, I haven't done that. And I'll tell you what, I don't know about y'all, but you know, as we've done baptisms for 20 years, when I love baptizing children and people who first come to faith, but I applaud as well the courage and the work of God in someone who's older and says, you know, I've just let this slip and uh, I want to be baptized in front of my church body. I hope you would consider that. Let's pray for our offering. Join me, please. Father, for your good gifts to us, we are grateful, and thank you that every week we gather, we get to give. It is a physical expression of our faith that you own everything, and we return this portion to you in Christ's name. 
Amen. If the ushers would receive that offering, please. This morning's text is from Colossians 1. Let's read this together. We believe he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of of his cross. This is the living word of God for us today. Thank you, Lindsay. If you have it, I'm going to encourage you to take out your Colossians Philemon book. Uh, This is a great way to track with us through our study in Colossians. We have more on order. I know people you know, you know, you didn't get one, uh, you may lose it. But we're going to have some on order. And so I, I want you to know it's never too late to grab one. So, you know, next week, we don't have men yet. If you have men, grab it. Because we're going to be in this for months. We'll be in this book. And it enables you to take notes, um, et cetera, as we move through it. And you'll note, as Rob did last week, you know, we've drawn in it and having you draw stuff so that uh, you can understand the text better. I do want you to look to the side screens as I read a few quotes this morning. I'll read it. You can track along on the screen. No one is ever really at ease in facing what we call life and death without a religious faith. The trouble with many people today is that they have not found a God big enough for modern needs. Many men and women today are living often with inner dissatisfaction without any faith in God at all. This is not because they are particularly wicked or selfish or godless, but because they have not found a God big enough to account for life, big enough to fit in with the new scientific age, big enough to command their highest admiration and respect. It is the purpose of this book to expose the inadequate conceptions of God which still linger unconsciously in many minds and which prevent our catching a glimpse of the true God. So wrote J.B. Phillips, many of you probably caught on to this, in his 1952 classic, still in print today, Your God is Too Small. 1962, A.W. Tozer penned his classic devotion, still in print today, and he wrote these words. What comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. 
For this reason, the gravest question before the church is always God himself. And the most portentous fact about any man is not what he is at a given time, what he at a given time may say or do, but what he in his deep heart conceives God to be like. We tend by a secret law of the soul to move toward our mental image of God. This is true not only of the individual Christian, but of the company of Christians that compose the church. If J.B. Phillips and A.W. Tozer are correct, and I believe they are, uh, then we would be hard-pressed, you all, to find at any moment in history a greater and more pressing need, both personally, so like for, for me individually, and for us corporately as a church, than a true and a faithful conception of all that God is and he has revealed himself to be. It certainly seems like, honestly, this was on the top of Paul's mind when he wrote this small church gathered in Colossae, new believers who had come to faith through the work of Epaphras. Epaphras. And I say it seems to have been on his mind because he's not, you know, he's 14 verses in, and Paul, in verses 15 to 20, launches into this glorious, magnificent, exalted, comprehensive description of the person and work of Jesus. We do know now today that this was probably one of the one of the church's earliest hymns. The way it's written, you know, all the literary structure, etc. Uh, it, it's poetic. It's it, it's a it's a lyric. Uh, N. T. Wright, an excellent Bible, you know, scholar, he says this: someone who writes this way, like the, the, this hymn, wants his readers to stop and think. So, so that's what we've done. We've, we've slowed down, and as we go through this book of Colossians, we said we're going to take verses 15 to 20, and we're just going to take a two verses at a time because we want to stop here and think. And what is it, as we have examined the hymn, we've been stating the hymn since we first began Colossians. You know, what is it that that Paul wants the readers, original readers, and us to stop and think about. Just think about it. And what, what does he want us to see? It's not a trick question. Because when you read it, you go, well, he wants us to see Jesus, right? I mean, it's the, it's the hymn of Christ. Now, this is where I, I want us theologically to, to nail this down that it might never be shaken. He wants us to see Jesus because when we see Jesus, we see who? Say it. God, y'all, that's, this is profound. What's God like? What is, he, what is God like? How does it? Jesus you see Jesus and you see God. And as Tozer and, and Philip say, that's, this is our most pressing need, to see God. So Paul says you need to see Jesus. Nothing could be more important. Here's what I'm going to try and do in our time today. I know it's just two verses, but as you've noted already, they are loaded. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to take the two verses, 19 and 20, and I'm going to show us how Paul doubles down. It's like he doesn't back away from it. As he ends the hymn, he doubles down on who Jesus is and all he has done. And then I want to step out of the text, and I'm going to take the board up here, and I want, to, I want us to step back and go, okay, if Paul's doubling down on Jesus, then surely we would see this, this exalted Jesus and the, and the focus upon Christ. It, surely we would see it in different places in the Bible, and I'm going to show you how, in fact, we do. With me? So, let's start here. 
look at your booklet or your Colossians in, in your Bible. Uh, I want to take verses 15 to 18 first because 18 launches us into 19 and 20. We could never read this enough. Just follow along in your Bibles. Paul says, he, this is Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. This is what Rob picked up last week. And he is before all things. And in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. That in everything he might be preeminent. That word preeminent sets us up for verses 19 and 20. Two things to note before we, we, we read 19 and 20. The first word in verse 19 is going to be the word for. You could translate that because. Uh, it is, um, it's, an, it's an adverbial causal conjunction. You know, I read this stuff and I go, what does that mean? I have to look it up myself. Well, it simply means it's a purpose statement for. He, he is preeminent because, and then he's going to go on and say why he's preeminent. Um, the reason Jesus is preeminent is because, verse 19, read it, follow along with me. Because in him, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. Fullness means all the completeness. There is nothing that God is that Jesus is not. All that God is, Jesus is. The fullness of God was pleased. The, the, the word we could put there is, was delighted, glad. In Jesus, the fullness of God was glad to dwell. Dwell, it, 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 obviously, it means to, you know, to inhabit. But again here, the nuance to this is it's not, it's not an overnight stay at a hotel. It is to inhabit, reside, dwell permanently. Jesus is preeminent, and preeminent is just, we can take the English translation of that, you know, the, the definition, it is to be exalted above, over, beyond all, preeminent, because all that God is delights to permanently reside in the Son. That's verse 19. Look at verse 20. And through him, this is where you, I want you to track with you on this. And through him, Jesus, to reconcile to himself, God the Father, all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace through the blood of his, Jesus' Jesus's cross. Now, I hope when you read this, it kind of sounds familiar, like, I hope when you read that, you kind of go, it just sounds like he's saying what he already said, because he is. This is the double down. You remember two weeks ago, I drew up on the board the, the three prepositions in 15 and 16, where, where I said, you know, the, the, the first one was the end, the E-N, N, and I said, in him, all things were created, in him, and then and they had that second preposition, which was dia. D-I-A, which is through him. And then there was that third preposition, which was E-S, E-I-S. And, and I said, that's for him. In, through, and for. He does it again. It's, it's no accident. So it's, it's, this, it, it's the same as it was before. In him, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. Through, dia, through him to reconcile all things 
to himself. That's the end. It's translated here not for himself, which it could be, but to himself. Jesus is preeminent because through him God has reconciled to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven. And so you go, wait, wait, he, he, talked, he talked earlier about heaven and earth. Yeah, yeah, he did, didn't he? Whether things in heaven or on earth, visible or invisible. It, it's, to, it's to take in the whole scope. You remember I drew on the board, there's the heavenly realm. There is a reality that's heavenly, that's spiritual beings that would blow our minds, but it's, it's as real as anything that we know physically. So whether it's the physical world or the spiritual world, he created all things and he repeats it here. He reconciles all things, whether in heaven invisible or on earth visible. So what does it mean that all things are reconciled? We're, we're working on a few of these words as we move through here. What does it mean to reconcile? Well, we get a we get a notion of it, okay? We get pointed in the right direction in the last phrase, making peace. So this is, making peace is a part of reconciliation. It's a great place to start to unpack this word. And the first thing we can note is there has to be non-peace for him to make peace. And indeed, in our world today, in our own hearts, right? In your own personal little world surrounding you, there's, there's not peace. And so he's talking here about things, he's talking about making peace in these places. Now, it's not just the absence of conflict. And this is where, and we've done this before, I think, but, but when you think about biblical peace, you've got to turn the diamond and see the facets of biblical peace. Now, I want to I give you what I, what I think is a simple statement and yet captures the essence of biblical peace. And, he, and here's what it is. Shalom you know, is a Hebrew word, but here's, here it is. Everything as God intends. Everything as God intends. You see, we can often think of peace as a cessation of conflict. Uh, you know, in, in, in friendships, you can have a friendship that you're in conflict, you can resolve the conflict, but, but there may not be peace, right, in, in that. If, um, you know, in the Middle East, if, if, if they ever stop, you know, bombings and killings and in the United States, if we, people weren't killed, we didn't hurt each other, we didn't harm each other in various ways, and we all stopped doing that, please know that would not be biblical peace because that, that's just a cessation of hostility. Biblical peace is everything as God intends. It's much deeper and fuller more comprehensive, and we'll see it when I go through the biblical story in a moment. Well, okay, so then the, it ends by, by telling us how this reconciliation, how this making of peace was achieved, and it's that simple phrase, by the blood of his cross. Blood, according to the Bible, is life. The, the life is in the blood, we know that a cross is, you know, is actually in Jesus' day, and, and, and Paul, when he's writing this, it's a means of death. This is where people die. So what he's saying is, by the, by the dying of Jesus, okay, because his life's poured out on this death instrument, the cross, he's made it so that there's peace in all the entire creation. If I said it another way, I would say it like this. Through the death of Jesus, God has put the whole universe back together. He has brought everything to be 
as it was made to be. So I want to kind of a caveat, and let's note this. Okay, is, is he saying it, what would be described as universalism, i.e., oh, by the blood of Jesus, in the end, everyone is saved. Is that what he says here? No. And I want to give you the reason why we know he's not saying that. Remember last week I talked about context, or two weeks ago, context is king. And I said, you know, when you're interpreting a Bible passage, you know, the context is truly, really the ultimate final arbiter. There's another principle we use when we interpret our Bible so we don't mishandle it. And it's called the analogy of faith or the analogy of Scripture. And all that phrase means is this. You cannot take one verse and interpret it in such a way that it is contradictory to the whole of Scripture. So when we look at this verse and he speaks of, and, God, and through the blood of Christ, you know, all things are reconciled. He, he can't mean that all things are salvifically saved because we know the rest of the Bible is so clear to teach that in a, two weeks ago I talked about this, that, that fallen angels, demons, evil, the devil, they, they are not brought into reconciliation with God in a saving way. There is eternal damnation. That's just and justice and truth. And in the same way, the, the Bible tells us that human beings who, who in their lifetime choose never to put their trust in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus for the forgiveness of their sins will in physical death be spiritually separated from God forever and spend an eternity apart from God. So th this is, you know, that's what the whole Bible teaches. So we know Paul's not talking about universalism here. And here's where I really need you and want to encourage you to think and track with me on this. And what does this reconciliation mean that he speaks about? Well, in this context, it means this, and then I'm going to unpack it. It means every and, <coughs> excuse me, every and all things will be rightly related to God. Every and all things will be rightly related to God. Now, as I unpack this, you'll see why it's not universalism. It's something utterly different. As I said earlier, we know the Bible teaches that there is an eternal damnation for the devil and the, the awfulness of death and, and, and what the curse has brought. The devil, evil, will get exactly what it deserves. That's not a lack of compassion or a lack of love. There, if, if there's no justice in love, it's not love. No, that's, that's love. That's truth. Think about our own salvation if you've placed your faith in Christ. Because of sin, because we choose to do things wrong, we think wrong thoughts, we're not holy. I mean, we know this. And because of that, we're separated from God and, and we deserve eternal separation from God. We deserve death, the Bible tells us. But if we put our trust in Jesus... And we say, Jesus, what you did, you did for me. And you see in that moment, because of what Jesus did by the blood of the cross, he died in my place so that I would never have to be separated from God. Jesus did that for me. And the perfectly righteous life that Jesus lived, you understand, holiness can tolerate nothing but holiness. But I'm not a holy person and neither are you. But Jesus is. And so when we put our trust in Jesus, his holiness, his righteousness is credited to the believer. Does this make sense? So when we speak of this reconciliation of all things, when I die physically, I won't, be, I won't be separated from God forever. 
because of what Jesus did for me and because I'm in Jesus. Said another way, the Christian gets what Jesus deserves. See that? So, so truly, I, I want you to hear this. Every created being, spiritual, physical, gets exactly what they deserve. That's justice. That's truth. And that's what he's talking about here in this reconciliation. No human being, you all, will stand before God. Um, no spiritual being, you know, could stand before God and say, you're unjust by condemning me to an eternity apart from you. They, they, they can't. And no human can. You've got the opportunity today to put your confidence and your trust in Christ. And if he so leads you, I would encourage you to do that. Now, because Jesus died on the cross, I want you to understand something you got to expand salvation beyond you and your personal relationship with Jesus. It's just way, kind of the way we view it, especially in the Western church. Um, because he died, there is no part of creation. So, so even get your mind beyond the planet Earth. You need to go out to the farthest galaxies and all that exists anywhere and anything. Because of the blood of the cross, okay, there will be no part of creation physical and invisible that is left distorted, broken, and unreconciled. You remember Romans 8? I'm just going to read it to you. Many of you are familiar with this. For all creation is awaiting, is waiting eagerly for that future day when God will reveal who his children really are. This is New Living Translation. Against its will, all creation was subjected to God's curse. But with eager hope, the creation looks forward to the day when it will join God's children in glorious freedom from death and decay. For we know that all creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. What, what Paul says there and the Bible says throughout is, y'all, the fall affected creation. I mean, I know the world is awesome, and, and you know, you and I have been to places where it took your breath away. That's nothing, nothing compared to what it would have been had it not fallen, and honestly, it's nothing compared to what it will be in a new heaven and a new earth in the absence of sin. Creation takes on a persona. It's not a Disney movie. It's the Bible. But creation itself takes on a persona that groans to be restored to the pristineness, you see, of what God intended always. And so one of the things I think this encourages us to do is kind of get out of our individualistic salvation in the sense of I'm saved, my salvation's me. Do you understand the blood of Christ? Yes, it was to save you. But it's to save the entire universe you know that people say, you know, if I was the only human being living, Jesus would have died on the cross for me. You know, that's true, but you, you, got, you miss this when you say that. Yes, he would have died for you, but understand his death for you would have been also for the fallen angels, for visible, invisible. It, it was for the whole of creation to redeem it. I mean, it makes salvation go poof, you know, in our brains, in our hearts. So great and grand is this salvation achieved by Jesus. Okay. Now, let's look. If Paul is exalting Christ in such a way, where in the Bible do we see this? In other places. And this is where I want you to think about the story of the Bible. Now, it's going to be up on the side screens for those of you who can't see this. So just know that you can look up on the side screens and you can catch this. And I've written most of it in, so I'm just going to highlight some stuff for speed, for time. Now, the first thing I want to do on here is I want to remind us that the story of the Bible, 66 books, Old Testament, New Testament, is really captured under four headings. The first is creation. In the beginning, God 
created the heavens and the earth. And then we're not even in, we're into chapter three only in the Bible, and we see there is a great, we call it a fall, wherein Adam and Eve chose to eat of the fruit. That God said you can eat of all of it, but not this when they rebelled against God. Creation, fall, and then we see the work of God go into the work of re redemption. This is that idea of, of, of reconciling, redemption. And we know this, that there is a future day coming when God, Jesus will come back in the, and we, we call it, in the re creation. Okay? Everybody with me? So there's the, the, the major headings of the story of the Bible. Creation, fall, redemption, recreation. I have put five categories on the left-hand side. And again, you got to look up this screen to see this. I've got five categories on the left-hand side that we're just going to move through this story of creation. And at the end, we're going to ask, where's Jesus in all this? Okay, so in creation, let's take God's rule. God's rule in creation is direct and personal. Do you know they walked with each other in the garden? Adam and Eve walked with him. They spoke to each other. God's people, this is only Adam and Eve at the point, but God's people are relationally connected. Always think of death and fallenness as separation. Uh, Adam and Eve, they were connected with God, relationally connected with God, uh, with each other, uh, with themselves, understanding themselves, and with all of creation, okay? Pre-fall, God's place was a garden, a garden in Eden. And, and it's no accident in the same way. You remember our table series? God chose a table and the richness of a table. There's a reason he chose a garden and the flourishing and the fullness and the beauty and the abundance of a garden. God's plan. Well, how do we know what God's plan was? Well, we know, we, we could read Genesis 1 and 2 and know, well, here's what he instructs for humanity, and we can pull out of that and go, well, his plan is for humanity, human beings, to co-reign and co-rule with him over creation. This, you know, this, this is not a fairy tale. This is no Game of Thrones thing. This is the Bible, and this is the truth of God. It's not even that he would say, you know, you're gonna, I'm going to give you a little piece of land. You know, you're going to get to manage your house, and you get 50. Creation to reign, co-reign and co-rule with him. What's God's purpose? I mean, why, God? Why, 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 why this and nothing? Why did God create everything there is? Why, why are we here? God's glory and human flourishing. But why? God's glory and human flourishing. God in the counsel of his own will chooses to create, to make us, to put us on this planet and invite us to co-reign and co-rule with him. Everybody with me on that? Creation. And then you go to the fall and, and you know what happens in the fall, Adam and Eve rebel. Uh, God said, just trust me, and this is, what I, this is what I want for you, flourishing. And they choose to eat of the one tree that God said, don't eat of that tree. And there's a fall. And so God's rule is rejected, right? And now there is a curse. And we read the curses in chapter three. God's people are now relationally disconnected and fragmented. You know, for us as a church, our mission is to help people find wholehearted life in Jesus. And wholehearted is a big deal in the Bible. And that's why it's a big deal to us because in the fall, the heart, that, that part of you that's your thoughts, emotions, desires, and choices exploded. They're no longer integrated and together. Our hearts are all fragmented and it's reflected in how we treat one another and how we relate to God, how we relate to creation. And even how we relate to ourselves. God's place is now out of the garden. You're out of the garden. God's plan. This is fascinating. In Genesis 3, God makes a promise. And again, we've talked about this. Theologians call it the, the proto-evangelion, the, 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 the first 
good news, so to speak. But it's really foggy and oblique. But he says, a man will be born of a woman and he will crush the serpent's head. That's just totally loaded. If I could rephrase it, God's promise, God's statement there, though not fully, you know, not fully developed, right? There's not, not been the progressive revelation of God is this. I'm going to make all this right. It's this promise. I'm going to make all this right. So why, God? Why are you going to make all this right? Listen, I want you to know this never changes God's purpose for his glory and human flourishing. That's why. Creation, fall, redemption. So if God makes a promise, there's going to be a man who's going to crush the serpent. This is very interesting. Just go right here. Well, in, in redemption, in God's work of redeeming, he chooses a man, Abraham. And he tells Abraham, uh, you're going to have a land of peop and people and you're going to be a blessing. Again, what does all that mean, so to speak? Well, God chooses to form a nation called Israel. Why did God choose Israel and not Iran or some other? Why did he choose Israel? Because. <laughs> not because they were any better than anyone else. Do you know Abraham was a pagan worshiping other? Because. Because God's God and we're not. And he chose Israel. And I've often described Israel as the womb through whom the Messiah would come, you know, but you only got this kind of, kind of got this little foggy promise, but Israel would be the nation through whom the Messiah would come. Let's talk about God's rule. So God birthed this nation. He gives them the law. You know, the law is outside in. Here's what it says. You better do it. Here's what it says. You better do it. It's outside in. God's people is, it's the nation of Israel. And then ultimately I'll put something else on here and, 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 and God's People become the church. Promises to Abraham. Why Abraham? Why Israel? God's glory and human flourishing. Now, here's the biggie. So in this process of redemption, God through the nation of Israel shows that sin requires death. Life is in the blood. They kill these animals because something's got, you got, somebody's got to die to pay for your sins for this year, pay for your sins for this year, pay for your sins today. So blood and death pay the penalty for sin on and on and on. And then in the fullness of time, what do we know? Uh, Paul says in Galatians, the fullness of time, you know this, Jesus comes, the God-man he lives the life we couldn't live. He dies the death we deserved. Every lamb and ram and goat and bull that was sacrificed here was simply pointing to Jesus who would be the lamb of God who by his death, by his blood, would satisfy the wrath of God against sin. Everybody with me on this so far? So, so Jesus comes and of course now that we know that we, we live, by the way, we live between these two times. There was a moment in time when Jesus came, and there's a moment in time when he's coming again. It's been 2,000 years. I don't know how much longer it will be. No one does. But when he comes again, even as he came the first time, God's rule, this is true now, but in the absence of sin, God's rule now is in the heart. It's in the heart for us as Christians, but fully and finally in the new heaven and new earth. Uh, God's people, the church, we believe God has a plan for Israel as well. I could say up there, the people of God, indwelt by God with new hearts, born again through faith in Christ. This is the people of God. God's place is a new heaven and a new earth, and I just didn't want you to miss, when you read your Bible, it's a garden. It's a garden. Well, that's what it was in the, yes, it's a garden. And then I put, what's God's purpose? And I added just a word. His purpose, God's greater glory in human flourishing. Lloyd, why did you put God's greater glory? Because it is God's greater glory In other words, God is more glorified 
who God is and all God is is more fully declared to the heavenly, invisible, spiritual realm and beings and to all created things. It is more fully revealed through a redeemed humanity and a redeemed creation rather than had, had there never been a fall. This is hard to get our heads around. God had no plan B. Adam and Eve didn't sin, and he, and he thought, need a change of focus here. Uh, how am I going to work this out? This has always been God's plan. And when you look at the story in the Bible, and we, we listen to what the writers say, everything in the Old Testament, every, everything that they're doing in the Old Testament is pointing to Jesus. All of it is pointing to Jesus. He's the focal point of the whole thing. And that's why we can say God's, God is more glorified. Watch this. He's more glorified in that he crushed the sun. That he crushed the sun to redeem a humanity and a creation. And that Jesus rose from the grave. And now the whole universe says, preeminent, exalted one, Jesus, you are, you're all, you're everything. It takes nothing away from the Father nor the Holy Spirit to shoot the focus upon Jesus, the God-man. And so we look at this story of the Bible, and I'll ask you this question. So, guys, if Jesus, if it's all about Jesus, where is Jesus in the whole story? I mean, just take Colossians that we've just read. I'll tell you where Jesus is. He created the whole thing. <laughs> I'll tell you where he is. He was the promise of the one who would be born of a woman and crush the serpent. I'll tell you where he is. He is the perfect lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And do you know in the new heaven and the new earth, John says, you don't need a son. Because Jesus will be all the light you need. See, I, suddenly, suddenly I see that and I go, It makes me ask the question, and I'll ask you. Is your Jesus too small? Because mine sure is sometimes. I want to ask the ushers to pass out the elements for the table. How good that we can come after this text to the table of Jesus. Because as grand and glorious, exalted, preeminent as he is, he's, he's one of us in the sense he's a human being. And he says, come to my table. Come to me for life, for flourishing. As the elements are passed, take the bread, take the cup and hold it. We'll take it together in a moment. And I want to invite you to invite the Spirit to open your eyes and to see this Jesus whom Paul describes in Colossians 1 and whom the whole Bible points to. If you have placed your faith in Christ, please take the bread and cup. If you haven't, this is a wonderful time for you to sit for a moment. You're at church today. You know, I, don't, I didn't tell you to come. You, you came. And so God is certainly at work in some way, and you may ponder for a moment, have I put my trust in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus? And if not, why not now?
Let's stand together as we receive the table in honor of the one whom we exalt. On the night in which he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took the bread and broke it and said, this is my body, broken for us. The one who created the universe, broken for us. And he might put us back together, so to speak, in the whole world. Jesus, for your body broken on our behalf, we give thanks and we take and receive. Take and receive the bread. And he took the cup and he said, this is the new covenant in my blood. Well, we're back to this passage, aren't we? The blood of the cross. The Bible says life is in the blood. This is Jesus' blood was poured out. Jesus gave his life. You know, the song says it all, doesn't it? What more could he give? He gave everything. He gave his life. And by his life, his death, burial, and resurrection, We're put back together. We're whole. We're forgiven. This is joy undiluted. Lord Jesus, for your blood shed, we give thanks. Take and drink. You know, it's almost not enough. There's something in this that says, saying thank you is not quite enough. I, I, I don't know if you sense that or get that when we really contemplate Jesus. And the truth is, it, it, there's a part of that. It's not enough. You know what it requires? Worship. The exaltation of who he is and how he secured our salvation. So we lift our voices in these moments. I want to do this. If you are going to be praying up front, after the service, I want you to go ahead and come up front with me because I want anyone who wants to be prayed for, just prayed for, while we sing, come on up here and pray. Or you can come up here and kneel on the stairs, whatever you'd want to do, and then I will dismiss us in a moment. I'll be here to pray and others will be up front to pray with you. Let's lift our voices.
like someone to pray with you, we're here. would love for you to come down and let us pray with you. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in him, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. This is our Jesus whom we exalt and who loves us without reserve. God bless, you are dismissed. <laughs>